Nathan for inviting me. I, uh, as Nathan said, I'm sort of uh, standing, I'm kind of cut price Professor Simpson uh, for the afternoon to talk about our uh, ESE uh, funded project, Roads and the Politics of Thought. Having listened to the, the, the day's presentations, I feel that I might be taking you down a slightly different road, not just in terms of the kind of technical uh, sophistry of data management that's been discussed thus far, but also uh, in terms of I'm looking at it from the data collection firsthand and then into the kind of ways in which that we're dealing with this in an uh, uh, first and foremost anthropological and ethnographic uh, research project. So this is a five-year ERC research project that is um, somewhat interdisciplinary, involves another university. I'm from the University of Edinburgh um, and has a couple of PhDs, postdocs, uh, two co eyes and, and a PI working on it. And it's also regional in terms of its focus on South Asia. And it engages ethnographically with the uh, development of road infrastructure, particularly across the region. Um, so it's, it's broad in scope and um, involves a lot of data. And an ethnographic uh, uh, project involves data collection of up to a year or, or so in the field. So. What I think, I w the, the kind of point that I want to put across today, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the projects, because in an ethnographic and an anthropological project, what's really um, important here is understanding the context in which the data is gathered to consider the way in which the data is used. Um, and also when we start to talk about what are uh, uh, normally field notes scribbled down in leatherback journals, typically uh, when those fieldwork notes become to be talked of as data. Um, and finally, the kinds of uh, institutions, informants and participants uh, that kind of come into our research have got uh, uh, certain and particular interests in marshalling the kinds of conversations that are had around them. So we're dealing with um, quite sensitive data in that sense and also uh, opposing voices. So when we reveal our data and when we don't, uh, is also something to be considered. Okay, so let me just go through the overview. Uh, I'm going to talk in about the individual field sites um, as we go through, and I'll try and take them uh, one by one to give you a sense of the kind of research that we've been doing. Uh, in, in, and so to kind of talk about the way in which we have to uh, uh, look after, share, uh, hold, and collect our data. Um, I'm going to talk about what constitutes data and when we refer to it as data, and then how the data moves through the project life cycle. Uh, finally, uh, if there is time, I'm gonna, uh, I've got really kind of a set of open questions really about what happens to data at the end of a project, particularly when people move off it. Um, but say for example, later on down the line, they have to re-engage with that data because they've got corrections on whatever articles they've put in. You know, what are the, what are the kind of rules about that? Uh, again, an open question, really. Uh, so, the research sites. Um, Reunion Island, which is where Professor Simpson's been doing uh, some work. Uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, India, and the Maldives. Um, so, I'm going to go through each of these sites uh, one by one. So, the, in all of these places, to varying degrees, there have been huge uh, amounts of uh, energy and finance put into road infrastructure and ideas of uh, um, connectivity involving... Um, actors such as uh, the World Bank and the, um, the uh, international finance corporations, uh, various Exim banks, and then at a kind of government level, finance ministries, down to the business owners who are setting up stalls, down to uh, peasant farmers who are being kind of pushed off their lands uh, because rent prices have gone up and so forth. So there's a lot of different kind of scales at which we've been kind of gathering and absorbing data along the way. So uh, starting in Pakistan, for example, this is Tal Parker, um, which is a, a district in the province of Sindh in, in southeastern Pakistan. It's near the Indian border. And this is a, um, a researcher who's doing a project on a 400 kilometre stretch of road to an open cold field um, out in the middle of nowhere to Karachi itself. So, in this uh, particular research, he's been looking exactly at the kind of uh, uh, people who have been making their businesses along this. This is a road that's come out of a neoliberal uh, uh, vision. And, and kind of conjures up all sorts of ideas about modernity. So the people who are interested in this road are not only the coalfield miners, not only the uh, local authorities in Karachi, um, 
but also the various people who for, for a long time have been kind of moving up and down different stretches of this road throughout history. Um, this is a, a, really a political project as well. So when talking to local, um, local government agencies uh, and so on and so forth, the interviews that, uh, that are conducted in data gathering, how they're handled, uh, this is a politically kind of sensitive issue as well with lots of things to kind of be uh, taken into consideration um, in terms of anonymity uh, and protecting that especially. So moving on from Pakistan, we've got the next project which is, um, takes place largely in the Jaffna Peninsula uh, and focuses in one element of the, uh, a road called the A9 which stretches through what was the kind of uh, the area most affected by Sri Lanka's 30 year civil war. So in this context you've got a road that's going through, uh, built in a post-conflict situation. So you've got various people who are accessing uh, uh, new areas of this, of this area. Oh, well, not new areas, but having gained new access to areas of, of, uh, of this region. Um, there's been displacement on uh, ethnic and religious lines. Uh, and there's also been the um, interests of the uh, government in building road projects and expansion into an area that was once held uh, by a, a terrorist organisation. And then there is uh, with the, L the LTTE, and then there is um, the interests of uh, the the army and so on and so forth. So, that, so as you say, so so I was saying, collecting data in this, um, doing anonymous interviews, uh, moving hard drives with uh, recorded files of those interviews with those people's voices that are kind of still locatable. Uh, getting um, consent to do the research, to do the, uh, that's not written but verbal, uh, meeting, meeting it in a way that makes sense to the field, uh, but also kind of prescribes to the, uh, or, or subscribes to the um, ethical concerns laid out in the ASA and in the various institutions as well, uh, is something that's kind of had to be taken in consideration. This is research of a kind of political nature as well. So then uh, in India, what we've been looking at here is a huge amount of data because it involves a uh, research project, uh, which isn't a project, sorry, it's a, it's a road program uh, that involves about 50,000 subcontractors building, uh, I think, 40, something like 20 or 30 billion US dollars worth of rural roads that connect to larger uh, highways in India. Uh, which is a flagship program of the Indian government uh, based on a kind of uh, idea about um, economic development and connecting rural areas up to larger markets. Uh, so our researcher doing work here is dealing with government agents, uh, bureaucracies, as well as the World Bank, as well as the um, people from these rural locations, uh, visiting these areas, spending time with the people who live there, uh, but also spending a lot of time in the kind of bureaucratic offices and being part of that machinery. So that's a kind of uh, sense of the sort of data that's being uh, collected in this uh, programme. And it's huge. Similarly, sorry, I should mention as well, there's, uh, so there's not only kind of interview-based data and uh, participation, uh, observation, uh, participation, um, sort, of, sort of cornerstones of ethnographic work, but there's also a lot of uh, secondary data to do with uh, the kind of uh, wealth of documents that come out of the development industry itself, as well as um, the kind of political publications, the newspaper, the press, the, uh, everything that kind of falls away from a large road programme. Uh, and then finally, oh, here we go, the Maldives, which is where, uh, where I've had the pleasure of being for a year during my research. Uh, <laughs> there's a saying that, you, that, that, that researchers get the the sites that they deserve. But anyway, so I was looking, I was looking at the Maldives and at this, so at the different scales of this research project, it meant traveling to lots of the islands that are all occupied, uh, occupied, inhabited uh, islands. And some of them were about kind of covering small roads in these islands uh, with tar in the name of, uh, in the name of development as well. Um, so this, uh, for this research, I worked with uh, vulnerable migrant labour from Bangladesh, um, uh, Sri Lankan outsourced companies that were managing this, uh, the local island agencies who were 
uh, um, managing the Sri Lankan outsourced contractors and then the central government uh, as well as the exiled government in Sri Lanka as well to kind of get a build a bigger picture of like why is it that these island roads are being uh, covered in, in tarmac what's kind of behind this as well as these kinds of roads I also looked at some of the large connectivity uh, projects as well which involved the interests of China and, and, and larger players also uh, which kind of this is a a road that's about 15 kilometres long on the Maldives' largest atoll, which is here connecting a couple of those, three or four of those islands in yellow over on that side. So the kind of data collection that we've all been involved in, um, as I've mentioned before, stru structured and semi-structured interviews and um, uh, participant observation, as well as dealing with all of the different scales, kind of over a long period of time gathering it, this all up, we've also been kind of uh, taking photographs and making films uh, of the roads in various ways, which I'll come on to later. So, right. Yeah, sorry, probably should have snapped off that side a little sooner. So, yeah, some of the interviews that we've done have been, you know, as all of you who have done research, um, they, are, they sort of move between being structured, semi-structured, and completely opportunistic which is when you get your chance to talk to the person that you seem is significant and you jump on it and there's not always the, uh, the, the kind of research data collection that you do in, in the cut and thrust of uh, active research um, is not always easily kind of folded into the kind of operational way that it's put down in the research uh, manuals and, and, um, and so forth. So we've got uh, the film side of it, which has been, uh, for some of the researchers, this has been kind of putting the camera on the vehicles as they move through and document the road development. Um, some have been filming interviews within vehicles uh, on the move. And uh, I myself, um, I, gave the, I gave the cameras to the research participants to attach to their motorbikes to kind of uh, film the condition of the island roads as they went round and what they perceived to be kind of dangerous or, or, or how they use their vehicles. Uh, and in this, the data, how did it move? Well, it went from the cameras and their phones that they had for themselves into the project, um, as well as the GoPros that we gave them. Um, we sat down and we collected the films together. They got copies of, as well. Um, and we looked through them to do a sort of rough edit in the field. Uh, and then, moving on from that, we... Um, Oh, I'll just stay on this one for a second. So then moving on from this, we, uh, we uploaded them onto an archive, uh, a digital uh, media platform on um, uh, run out of Mumbai, which I'll come on to talk to in a little later. So the data, the ownership, the creation and the production, the, the lines of this all get a little bit blurred as we, as we kind of go through the project. Um, so, and then the other, yeah, I guess the other forms of data, we've been looking at archives and online collections. And this can be like buildings, or tier of files with, um, with online articles or, or clips to YouTube videos and so on and so forth. So there's a kind of uh, a massing of data from different, different levels throughout the project. So what is data? As an anthropologist uh, and as an ethnographer, first and foremost, data for me throughout my PhD and within this project, it was, it was always referred to as field notes. And it was what I um, spent my evenings writing up. Um, it's what I scratched down on uh, smaller bits of paper throughout the day as I spent time with my informants. Ethnographic research requires a lot of hanging out, deep hanging out, as it's otherwise referred to. Um, and it's a kind of long-term, generous engagement with the field that's often hard to um, translate or describe in, in something the length of a PhD thesis never mind something the length of a journal article. So you kind of have to be a bit selective about this data, but the method of, of writing it up, you get this, you know, this huge amount to, to, to kind of start with. But I would never at that stage of my research start calling it, uh, start calling it data, to be, to be honest. Um, and then the other stuff that we're, we're dealing with, as I mentioned, Jeff, yeah, filming and some, some photographs, which never had any, for me anyway, some, any real sort of, um, systematic I'd see these things, I'd take photographs of them, they would go in a Word file, they would go onto, uh, onto the, onto, on, not a Word file, they'd go into a file on my computer under photographs of, and then and that would be kind of the level at which it would work. As I said before, this isn't as sophisticated as some of the conversations that have happened earlier today. Um, so uh, what, what stage of analysis are my field notes and my scratch notes 
um, what, what stage do they become data and at what stage do they become shareable? It's really difficult to say. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily um, offer out my field notebooks. That's not a practice in anthropology that's uh, often done, although there are some moves towards that. There are a lot of anthropologists and ethnographers who keep their field notebooks very close to them. What they work at uh, being open access is these nice pros that kind of come out at the end. And that's not just out of uh, vanity for wanting to show people that you can write well and um, so on and so forth. But in our kind of research, it's also uh, an, uh, a sort of safety concern as well because working through issues of uh, anonymity, um, working through phrasing the kinds of arguments that you want to make and the kind of positions that you want to take is important because, as I said uh, initially, you're, you're dealing with, or we are dealing with, uh, institutions who are very concerned about the kind of public discussions that are going on around them. So your kind of early ramblings in the field of, of what you feel is going on need to, need to be kind of worked through over time. So my kind of open question is, at what point in that time, when you, when you belong to a project like this, do you allow that to be, to be open? Because there are all sorts of kind of um, things you could leave yourself hostage to fortune uh, about. So then how does the data move through the research project life cycle? So we have, we have a PI at the top, then two co-eyes belonging to two different institutions. Um, about four postdocs and a couple of PhDs. But we also have a local partner, which is a Mumbai-based uh, film arts collective. Uh, so when we have data, we have what? We have word files, written up kind of notes that we've taken whilst we're in the field. We've got files that are collections of photographs that we've taken. We've got some media files of the interviews that we've done that we uh, are yet to transcribe because we're still in the middle of nowhere. We've got... Um, maybe some early film footage as well. So when we share it between uh, my line manager and, and, and me, we, uh, we had the, the VPN that the university provided that worked with varying degrees of success uh, in very rural locations. Uh, and then we had a Microsoft One drive that was uh, allowed to be, was preferred over the Dropbox because uh, it wasn't hosted within the EU. Um, and so for a large amount of time, the, the data that I'd collected would be sitting on my laptop or sitting, you know, if I was, <laughs> if I was being particularly good, it would be on an external hard drive. Um, and when we, share, when we share data between the two of us, it was, often, um, it was often over email. It was largely over VPN, but more, I guess more commonly over uh, email. This is what I've written up about this particular place so far, um, which... Uh, is possibly in contravention to some of the ways in which data, I'm, I'm sure we'll hear more from Helen tomorrow, but the way in which data should be moving. But in the, in the kind of rough and tumble of active research, that's the way it tends to, <laughs> tends to move. Um, and data moves horizontally among the, among the postdocs as we share the work. We're now in the, so I've been back in the UK since April, and we're now in a stage where we're kind of getting our papers together and working through stuff. So we're sharing, we're sharing data. Uh, horizontally between us and up between ourselves and our PIs. But the data also moves, I'm going to just keep referring to it as data now, it also moves uh, outside of the project um, but within the institution. So uh, a PhD student who's part of this ERC project might have another supervisor who belongs to the same university but isn't written into the ERC project in the same way. Um, and then we share outside the project again when we um, give briefings and so forth to the Mumbai-based film collective who are written in to be part of the project. Um, and where is data kept? Well, in terms of how we write it, how the, 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 the kind of written stuff and the, the databases that we've made of like you know, YouTube videos or uh, online materials, that's one thing. The film uh, data, however, if I've lined these slides up properly, is kept on an, on an online archive um, run by this um, a Mumbai-based uh, artist collective called Camp, and it's done on a system called Padma, 
which is interactive and it lets our, uh, our research participants also take part in editing the films as well. So they get a login and, it's, and they can just go through and they can make whatever changes, add labels, do some, uh, do some transcripts as well. So they become kind of involved in the research and making it kind of look polished, not just the research, but the, the, the project's outcomes as well. Um, so the film stuff is, is kept here. Um, it, the, 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 the system's called Padma. The technology, the technology behind it, I'm afraid I can't tell you much uh, about, but it's online and you'll be able to have a, a little look at that. Uh, I just know how to put the stuff on there. Okay, and then I guess I'm, I'm uh, almost getting us back on. So I'll just briefly say something about dissemination here. Um, written outputs. So coming at this as a, as a postdoc, um, there are kind of two agendas. Great. There, there are two agendas that, um, that seem to kind of battle against one another. One is that we have to have written outputs in high-ranking uh, peer-reviewed journals, uh, you know, impactful and all of this. But the other one is um, the data has got to be accessible as well to the information and the outputs, to the researchers, and, and, I, and there's a responsibility to kind of make it available as well, out with the kind of parameters of the, um, of the paywall journal system in the UK. Uh, so making something open access, but maintaining the obligations to not only the project, but also if you want to you know, get some permanent employment, then you want to have these kinds of journal articles as well. So that's one, of the, one kind of thing going on here. And the other, is, um, the other kind of dissemination is the project website, which kind of gives a, as a website often does around a project, a sort of snapshot of that. So in terms of data sharing after data collection, it's worked out through these two main uh, two main points, as well as the films. So they're, they're really, I think that's basically, um, not to, to labour it, I wanted to give you a kind of journey through our road project uh, and the kinds of things that we've been researching, the way in which we've been researching them, the way in which we've been understanding data and collecting it, and then thinking about the risks and implications of the, the way we disseminate it. So yeah, thanks very much.